live on WFLA Now. With a specialized degree in climate, Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist Jeff Berardelli is pioneering the way we look at climate and extreme weather. Welcome to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door. All right, welcome everybody. In today's Climate Classroom, we are talking about weather whiplash going from extreme wet to extreme drought from year to year. It is increasing fast in a warming world, and in California, snowpack is declining, and that is a huge water issue that's happening now, but but more so in the coming decades in the western U.S. Now, last week, I was in Lake Tahoe for Operation Sierra Storm. It is a weather-slash-climate conference where the best minds come together to talk about the issues of the day, and I want to bring in my guest today, uh, Dr. Andrew Swartz. He is the leader of the Central Sierra Snow Lab, UC Berkeley, or and that's located in Central California on the east side. And he lives in one of the nicest places there is, uh, not too far from Lake Tahoe. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Andrew Swartz. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me on, Jeff. It's a pleasure. So we have lots to talk about today. One of the things is that I'm very jealous of you because you're located in such a beautiful place. I think we have some uh, really nice video to share with you. So let's see if we can get this video to run. And if we can't, I may have to ask my... Uh, my uh, my tech folks to uh, to help me out with that. No, doesn't look like that video is going to run right now. But uh, with that said, yeah, you live in a in a great place. Uh, you know, you're at elevation. You you live amongst uh, one of the snowiest places in the U.S. And uh, although this year it hasn't necessarily been one of the snowiest places uh, in the U.S., uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put up a, a graphic of of what your do you by the way do you live at the at the snow lab as well or or is this is or do you just work there? I I used to live at the snow lab. Uh, I lived there for about two and a half years until this last September. But our staff is growing now, um, and so I've moved out in about five minutes down the road. Uh, but luckily, still beautiful next to wonderful Lake Tahoe. Well, there's Lake Tahoe. This is video uh, from essentially where we were just about a week ago at Operation Sierra Storm, uh, and that area is just such a beautiful place to live. Uh, But there are some changes that are ongoing, uh, big changes in the Sierra Nevada. So that's the reason why I wanted to have you on today to talk more about some of those big changes, uh, what is happening and uh, what we can expect for the future as well. So right now, and I showed that video earlier of uh, of the satellite photo of, uh, you know, this big atmospheric river, this big storm that's been slamming um, your area. Uh, It is a humdinger of a storm. So let's let's talk about it. What what is what are you noticing uh, in the West as far as this this these weather whiplash or the decrease in, in essentially snow cover? Well, we're seeing a couple different things, really. The first being that uh, we are slowly seeing a a transition away from snow in the winter to rain, Uh, you know, especially in the Sierra, the bulk of our precipitation historically comes in as snowfall. And now with the warming temperatures, we're seeing a lot of that even in the midwinter come in as rain, but especially in what we kind of define as the shoulder months. So October, November, um, April, and May. So we're seeing that for one. And for two, that means that our season is shortening. So we're seeing shorter season and in general, uh, a lot wetter of a snowpack because of that additional rain that we're getting. So I think this is a good time to bring up a graphic that you shared in your presentation, which I find really, really interesting and alarming, actually. So mm-hmm. I think you can probably see it on your screen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zo- I'm gonna zoom into this, and I want you, if you can, to take uh, our viewers through what they're looking at here, because I look at it and say, I hope it doesn't mean what I think it means. <laughs> Yes, it's it's kind of an ominous graph, and I, I've put it in a few of my presentations that uh, that I've given before, and my, my students, when I give this presentation, tend to refer to it as the graph of sadness. Um, but effectively, what we're looking at here uh, is the time to what we call a low or a no-snow future in California. So uh, when we talk about the decline of the snowpack, the warming of the atmosphere, of course, uh, we're concerned with our snowpack because it provides so much of our water, and we want it to stay around not just for our water resources, but also for our recreation as well. So when we look at the snowpack, basically every time you see one of those orange or red spikes, uh, that's a a year when we're seeing um, basically a a reduction in the amount of of snowfall. So uh, you can see on the left-hand side on that Y-axis, there's an area in percentage. And so we want the blues and the grays. 
because to take up more room. But as we can see, as we get towards 2050, it really starts shifting towards those reds and those oranges. And that means that we're expecting at that time to have much less snowpack in those areas, um, basically after that point. And we can go to these winters where we might have very little, if any, snow. So, you know, this is something that I didn't think about, but it was clarified by yourself and, and Dr. Daniel Swain at OSS Tahoe, which was that part of the problem here is that the snow levels are going up upward in elevation. And if you think about a mountain, right, it's wide at the base of the mountain. So maybe it, let's say 6,000 feet. But by the time you get to 8,000 feet, it's really very small. And so the percent area of snow cover, if you raise your snow levels by just 2,000 feet due to a warming climate, at least in part, all of a sudden the amount of area doesn't just go down by a little bit, it goes down by a tremendous amount because you don't have much area above 8,000 feet. So when we see that red, that's effectively no snow cover from mid, from the middle of this century onward to the late part of the century. So, I mean, that's a lot of, uh, it's a big loss of water runoff into the reservoirs for both human consumption and agriculture in California. This is going to pose a huge problem. So if I'm reading it wrong, let me know. No, no, that's absolutely right. And and what you said about lifting those those rain snow levels is absolutely true. Uh, last year, we had abnormally cold temperatures, which meant we saw snow in California on the western part of the state, even down to a thousand, uh, a thousand feet or or even below that. But the, realistically, the that's at odds with the trends that we're seeing, right? So we're seeing what we call the rain snow line or the line at an elevation in which we can expect rain or snow to occur, like you said, to hike up those mountains. And realistically, when we talk about snowpack as a water resource, that's water that we don't have to have come into our reservoirs right away like with rain. And so we want as much area as possible covered by that snowpack because that's going to enable us to uh, have to manage it less. Mother Nature kind of manages it on its own through melt processes and through, um, it, you know, the storage that occurs up there. So when we have this rain snow line raising higher and higher and higher on the mountain, it poses problems for uh, for one, our, our water management purposes, but for two, because that also means that um, the snowpack's not going to be there in the late spring or early summer when ordinarily it would help keep our forests moist. And then we can potentially end up with things like increased forest fire uh, due to drought and heat stress. Yeah, and that increase of forest fire is a, is a huge problem uh, because it's getting harder to live there, right? It's getting harder for people to get insurance on their homes. And if they can get insurance on their homes, and a lot of people can't, right? It's so prohibitively expensive. So, and this, and this also impacts tourism as well. You can't have as many people there visiting when, when there's a lot of smoke and people's health. So th for various reasons, this essentially, you know, the, not just the lack of snow cover, right, but this weather whiplash as well, going from extremely wet seasons like last year. I showed, let me bring this back up, actually. I want to show everybody how much snow you had last year. It was the second snowiest year on record for where you are. I think it was the snowiest year on record for other parts of Sierra Nevada, if I'm right. So there was a tremendous amount of snow, but you're you're seeing more of this, you know, really intense year uh, of water, whether that be rain or snow, and then the next year or two or three are very dry weather whiplash is increasing. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So we're seeing uh, these wetter wets and the drier dries. And one of the reasons that we see wetter wets, which can be a little counterintuitive when talking about climate, is uh, it's related to something called the clausius clapeyron equation. Um, and that's just really fancy equation that effectively tells us that Celsius that we have the atmosphere warms. It can hold about 7% more water vapor. So you are getting those good storms. It's holding more water vapor. It's able to squeeze that out in the form of snow and rain. But in the years when it's not coming over your location, it's going to be exceedingly dry as that additional moisture is going, you know, maybe to the north or the south or inland. And so we are seeing that big hydroclimate whiplash from one way to the next, um, where we can't really rely on a, something close to an average precipitation anymore. Yeah, so the graphic I have up right now is from Dr. Daniel Swain, 
And I think you can probably see it. I lost a little bit of the first thing you said. Uh, there was a connection issue. But you were basically talking about the clausius clapeyron equation and how for every two degrees Fahrenheit of warming, we have about 8% more moisture in the atmosphere. And so, therefore, you would expect it to get wetter in general around the world. But at the same standpoint, with more heat in the atmosphere, you have greater evaporation. You have snow melt that's melting earlier in the season. Therefore, you're drying out the ground. And we can see both of these things happening in this graphic. On the left, essentially, is more extreme storm storms in, in terms of precipitation or successive storms in a given year or a given season, let's say winter, and then more extreme dry years on the right. And they're happening at the same time over California. So it's getting wetter and it's getting drier at the same time, which I think is really hard to swallow as a regular person who doesn't study climate change. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe <laughs> you know, at times sitting there last year, I went, this is a lot of snow. Again, it's snow, second snowiest year on record. It's happened before. But it, the climate change is really making the likelihood of these extreme events increase and is making the intensity of them increase over time. And <clears throat> I think uh, because we are seeing an overall warming of the atmosphere, we're more inclined to think that we will see those extreme dry years as a result. Uh, because, as you mentioned, the higher temperatures lead to more atmospheric thirst and dry out our soils, uh, which cause drought. But that massive amount of precipitation in years like we had last year, that's an absolute climate signal, uh, climate change signal as well. And it has the fingerprint of, of us all over it, realistically. So both are going to increase, in, both in severity and occurrence, as we move forward, unless we can curb emissions. Yeah, so something like 80-plus percent of damages are due to atmospheric rivers out west, right? Because you get all your precipitation at once, and they're becoming more extreme. I'm going to show a graphic on that as well. At the same standpoint, you're getting much drier years. In fact, we were just through a period of time where it was the driest 22-year period on record since like 800 A.D., uh, in the West. And there are a lot more people that rely on a lot less resources out there in terms of water. So this is becoming a problem, not just for, right, but also for insurance. I mean, think about it. If you're an insurance company, you're not only having to protect people from, and, and, and essentially come up with more money because forest fires are burning and causing a lot more damage. They're getting worse. But at the same time, floods are getting worse. And we're going to see at some point in the future, uh, one of those massive flood events that only occurs once every hundred or 200 years, probably. Who knows when it's going to happen, but at some point it's inevitable that it will happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And to your point, you know, we've been seeing a lot of these same issues that Florida has in regards to insurance companies pulling out as the likelihood of having to pay out due to these extreme events gets higher um, amongst other mitigating factors. Um, <clears throat> and we do have these large climate change signals and things. And as, as you were referring to there, the arc storm um, that has kind of been in headlines uh, in terms of research over the last several years, and even uh, was a concern, I think, for some people um, earlier last week, although that was a, a kind of a false alarm. But, mm -hmm. you know, as we've studied the past, we've learned about these extreme, extreme weather events. And uh, through understanding how climate change and warming of the atmosphere is going to change the physics of it, uh, have realized that many of these events that we've seen that have already been extreme and problematic and, uh, you know, very costly in terms of uh, human lives and their monetary uh, their monetary contributions or or <laughs> you know their destruction effectively. Um, we we understand now that those are going to intensify as well, and it's hard to prepare for something. Um, that we haven't seen before, but it's something that we have to take into account when we talk about climate change. We always talk about how we built uh, our infrastructure for a, a climate of the 19th and 20th century, and that just simply doesn't exist anymore. So speaking of which, uh, this uh, graphic I took from a 2020 paper, I'm sure you've seen it a million times, and it is the historical intensity of atmospheric rivers, so essentially the Pineapple Express that we talk about. They're not all Pineapple Expresses, but some of them are. Uh, you can see that connection of tropical moisture, folks, if you're looking at this from Hawaii towards California, which is why they often call it a Pineapple Express. And on the right side, you can see how the color intensity increases, essentially meaning that the intensity of these atmospheric rivers in the future will increase. So California is getting a lot more of its rainfall and snowfall in shorter periods of time, and then there are longer dry periods. So essentially, you're packing a lot of that precipitation into really you know, quick-hitting, you know, successive uh, heavy storms, and that's not great for getting that water into reservoirs, and it's also not great when you go a longer period of time where it's drier, and now you're drying out the soil moisture even more. And longer periods of drought means means greater wildfires. Did I sum that up correctly? 
Absolutely. Yeah. With those drier, longer periods, we see increased atmospheric thirst. So we see evaporation of the existing snowpack. We see that drying of the soil as a result. And we see shorter periods with our snowpack. Uh, similarly, you know, these these big events, these big atmospheric rivers, they're great for contributing water to reservoirs that are empty. Um, but the problem is many of our reservoirs aren't just used for water storage. They're also used for flood mitigation. And so if we have reservoirs that might otherwise be looking full, we have to release some of that water to make room for potential flood issues. And so we run into this problem where we really want to see average conditions because we don't have to worry about flooding as much. It's easier for us to manage our reservoir during conditions that are close to average than having these extremes where we have these big atmospheric rivers dumping a ton of rain and a ton of snow all at once. So that's, that's the question, right? So as we go forward into the future, we essentially are going to have to figure out in California how to capture more rain because there is going to be more rain. There's going to be less runoff from snow cover because there is going to be less snow cover, not just because it's warmer, but because the snow elevation, the elevation of the snow is going further and further up the mountains, so there's less surface area. So how can California capture rain? It would seem a lot more difficult than capturing snow or runoff from snow, I should say. Well, there's, there's a few different ways that we can do this. Um, and a lot of people want more reservoirs. That's uh, an option, but it's not necessarily the only one. Uh, there, you know, there's proxies for California. One of my favorite things to talk about is the uh, millennium drought in Australia um, that, that affected them massively until about 2011 when it was finally um, ended by, by a good La Nina year. And one of the lessons that they took away was when you have those wet years, when you have those wet periods, use creative ways of collecting that water um, in order to make sure that you're prepared for the future. So one of the things they implemented uh, were rules around installation of rainwater capture tanks at homes and businesses so that in addition to larger infrastructure, things like reservoirs, but also desalination, we can have these little reservoirs at home that just come off of our own roof and provide an emergency source of water when things do dry out. So it's large infrastructure, but it's also things like rainwater capture, rainwater recycling, and doing little bits here and there around our own community. It, it, it sounds uh, somewhat similar to getting solar on your roof, right? I mean, you rely on the utility for your power, but if you can supplement some of that by by creating your own power, then that helps to solve not just your personal problem, but society's problem overall. That's absolutely it. You know, the, the more time that we're, or the more water that we're able to capture um, that's local to us, the less we have to rely on outside water sources. Uh, this is a, especially important in areas like LA that may not get a whole lot of rain, but if you can capture the rain that comes down, it means that you're going to be relying less, hopefully, on areas like the Colorado River, Lakes Mead and Lake Powell, that as we know, are already having issues with with emptying pretty quickly. So implementing those types of, of you know, initiatives around the house and around the community uh, can oftentimes be just as effective as larger programs. So with all that said, you know, I think we're about out of time. I want to ask you, is there anything that I did not cover during the day today that you think is important for our viewers to understand? Absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things where um, – there's there's a lot of I think anxiety and climate anxiety uh, surrounding these changes that are happening to the planet, but we are far from locked into this. We have the power to change things, to curb our emissions, to make sure that some of these future scenarios don't happen, and that we can you know go into a climate that that may not be the extremes that we are expecting. Um, so there is it. It's not necessarily all doom and gloom. It's good to be um, brought into that, but at the same time. We still have hope to turn things around, and we should do everything in our power uh, to do that. Yeah, that's that's good to know that there are solutions out there. And it's not just one, right? It's not a silver bullet. It's it's a lot of different smaller bullets <laughs> that we have to work on together as a society to change the way that we do business. Well, I, I want to say I appreciate you taking the time out. I should let everybody know that right now Dr. Schwartz is at the AMS conference, the American Meteorological Society conference in Baltimore, where there are probably a thousand meteorologists uh, that are there right now. It's a lot, I, I think. It's a, we uh, 7,700 of us. What? 70, biggest... I didn't even know there were 7,700 <laughs> meteorologists and climatologists. It's not just meteorologists and climatologists, but 7,700 people. Holy cow. 
biggest year on record so far from what, yeah. from what I'm told. So. Wow, that's amazing. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this. I appreciate it, Dr. Schwartz. Absolutely. My pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for having me on again. And I just want to rub it in. You know you're missing the biggest snow of the year so far right now because you're not, you're not in the Sierra Nevada when it's snowing you know, very hard. Yes, yes. I, I will be headed back tomorrow, <laughs> and it looks like the storm early next week might be up to three feet. So oh, hopefully okay. I'll be there for All that. Right, you'll one, be okay. I'm not going to cry. Any, <laughs> I'm not going to cry any tears for you. I'm I'm in I'm in Tampa, Florida, so I don't see us getting any three foot snowfalls anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Probably for the best. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. I appreciate it. I want to tell uh, our viewers and our listeners that you can read more about this on WFLA.com. Go to the weather tab and then click on Climate Classroom and click on that story right there, weather whiplash increasing in a warming climate. I want to thank everybody for joining me and remind you, you can listen to this, uh, not just watch it on WFLA.com or on our Facebook page, but you can also see it on YouTube. We'll take this uh, particular episode, we'll wrap it up and we'll send it to YouTube right after it's done. In addition, you can listen to it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. So I want to thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next week on Jeff's Climate Classroom. Watch or listen to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door on WFLA social media platforms. And find Jeff's Climate Reports on WFLA.com.